All right, let's get started. Hello, I'm Tass Melissanos, Vice President and General Manager of the ANZ region for WSO2, and welcome to our webinar on how to accelerate cloud-enabled financial services agility. As you know, in the last five or 10 years or so, we have seen a big shift from the traditional banks to embrace new digital tech like APIs, microservices architecture, and of course, cloud services to be a little bit more innovative and to improve the banking experience for their customers. Today, I have the pleasure to welcome our very own WSO2 CTO, Eric Newcomer, all the way from New York, a former head of architecture for, from a, U, a US bank himself, uh, to give you some personal insight, I suppose, and, and a view of the financial services industry on how these banks are pivoting to embrace the true value of cloud migration. G'day, Eric, and welcome from Down Under. Over to you, my friend, and uh, take it away. G'day, Tass, uh, thanks, and welcome, uh, everyone. Um, I'd like to talk to you today about unlocking the value of cloud migration, how we can deliver faster and better for customers and give them the kind of customer experience they've come to expect, especially from digital applications uh, and digitization projects. I think we all are very aware of the importance of digital transformation projects. Certainly this was something very big uh, at City while I was there, especially during the pandemic where in the consumer bank, we had to accelerate all the digital transformation projects to make sure that whatever we offered in the branches was offered online as well. So people didn't have to come in who didn't want to come in. Uh, just a bit about me before we get started. I joined in November, 2020 from Citibank. My most recent role there was chief security architect in the consumer bank, where I was head of cloud security for the consumer bank and worked on, for example, the uh, Google Plex application where we're integrating Citibank's, app, Citibank's banking application with Google Pay. I did the design of the authentication work there and supported that project on a daily basis working with uh, the Googlers. Before that, I was a chief architect at Treasury and Trade Solutions, which is the institutional bank. There we are doing the payments, credit, uh, corporate credit cards, international trade financing, running something like $5 trillion a day through the systems in place in 90 countries doing business 126. There I brought in uh, OpenShift and cloud technology, introduced microservices, got three applications running in production on our, our initially a private cloud. And we did a pilot on AWS of our payment processing systems, which I also redesigned and also created a uh, design for a payment tracking system based on big data. So I'm bringing in a lot of new technologies and new techniques and new capabilities, especially because in that part of the bank, we were doing payments for Uber drivers, for Airbnb, for Google Play stores. And we really, and Exxon Mobil payrolls, Army payrolls, those kind of huge processing jobs. And we needed the flexibility, we needed the agility, and we needed the scale of the cloud. And this is one of the main motivations we were moving there. Uh, and then later, of course, working in the consumer bank, one of the motivations for moving to the cloud where I was playing the security role uh, was to help get the digital transformations in place more quickly and give customers the experience they come to expect. Before that, I was CTO at, tech, at INO Technology. So for me, it's kind of a back to the future. I went into banking because uh, they were among our customers that I worked with there. Uh, and before that, I was a distinguished engineer, transaction processing and database, transaction processing architect, and digital equipment, which is now part of HP, mostly focusing on transaction processing and database. I've written some, uh, worked on some industry standards, some books, and created, uh, helped create a patent on, on mobile middleware back in, in the Iona days. So uh, welcome everyone, and let's uh, get started talking about uh, what we're doing at uh, WSO2 to help make sure you achieve the value of cloud deployments and provide the best experience for your customers who, who need that, those digital channels uh, interacting with them to provide better solutions, better support, more personalization, and more agility. But first of all, just to briefly mention WSO2, when I joined last year, it was already a successful company running 15 years, 16 years by now. It's a global company, uh, 50 million in revenue, growing still, growing 16% last year, more than that this year. We've got a great foundation, great company, a great success story already that we, we are working on. But for us, the question is, you know, is, is really is what's, what's next. These are the current products. We have API manager and identity access management server. These are in very um, 
I guess you might call them hot or active spaces in the market with respect to investment in APIs and managing APIs and building them and managing identities, especially for customer facing applications and having strict authentication policies, processes and authorizations as well. On top of those, we have solutions for open banking, open healthcare and some strategic consulting, which provides the basis of our, our success so far. So as I mentioned, the current projects uh, products that we have are successful, but but what's what's next for us? What I really want to talk about because what's next is is the cloud, and as Tass said in the beginning, a lot of companies really are starting to meet the challenge of how to move their applications, how to create their new applications, and interact perhaps in the hybrid world between the old way of uh, on-prem deployments and the new way of in the cloud deployments, and we'll get into all of this. Uh, how can we help bring our success from the APIM and CIAM products into the new world? We have helped customers build integration platforms for APIs. We've helped them with their digital innovation projects, some examples. Uh, we've worked with customers on these things, Fidelity, BNY Mellon, Hilton, Prime Therapeutics, Jaguar Land Rover, Dialog Echata, and others. And in helping them, we've observed that it can sometimes take a long time to build out the development aspect of these platforms so that all the software is there, the tools and the selections of the standards and the products that are needed to do the development. And the same thing for the deployment, that it, especially in the cloud, now we're talking about DevOps and DevSecOps and site reliable engineering. And all these things take a lot of time to put together with the tool chains, the build and deploy chains, all of these things. Sometimes in one case, at least it took a customer of ours two years to build this out before they could start innovating and start delivering their new projects in uh, the cloud native way that they wanted to do to get the most value out of them. So for us, what's next is to create a platform that's pre-built, takes all of this away all this effort away from the customers that we've worked with who spent years to put these things together. We put it together for them. It allows them to start innovating right away and have a great developer experience, great deployment experience for cloud native computing, which is where you want to be to get the most value out of your investments in the applications. Uh, so we understand. So what I want to do is explain a bit uh, about that, how we got to this point and then what we're doing about it. So first of all, I think it's no news to anyone that unique digital experience is a competitive uh, differentiator uh, these days. I think we're all you know, very aware of the original digital disruptors. Uh, some of the famous ones you know, around Uber, disrupting the, the transportation industry, Airbnb, disrupting the hotel industry, Netflix, Amazon website, Tesla, all of these digital innovator disruptors. And of course, Google, is very famous for disrupting GPS with Google Maps and, and, and uh, Uber built on top of that with their APIs. In the financial sector, we're seeing this disruption as well. And certainly when I was at City, we felt that very strongly that we had to react to, to the FinTechs because they were starting to provide uh, services that customers preferred uh, over the services uh, banking products that, did, that City was providing uh, at the time. We had a big focus on improving that and investing and moving to the cloud was a big part of that. But of course, we're seeing obvious examples in the market of Robinhood, Stripe with their AP successful APIs, Brex uh, with taking some of the more risk on loans than they were able to before, Chime as a personalized banking, reduced fees. All of these things are uh, possible because of advances in technology that allow them to apply AI, agile deployments, uh, personalization, capabilities to understand the customer problem and iterate more quickly to deliver it at speed. This is becoming a competitive necessity and becoming a point of competitive differentiation. Everyone has a unique way of doing business, but if it's not expressed in the digital channel on the mobile or web digital channel to the customers in a way in which they can react to it and respond to it in a way they're used to and expecting this now as they, they've been interacting with these other other companies' digital uh, transformations, so it's going to be a competitive uh, issue. Well, what does this mean? Well, you can't, uh, guess what? You know, you cannot buy this. You know, if you could buy it, everyone would have it. So now we quote from, you know, Jeff Lawson, who's been influential on our thinking. And, you know, I was, I had the good fortune to follow him at a conference presentation he presented first upon this topic about how you get the developers to understand what they need to do by working with the customers, understand their problem, iterate agilely through to improve the, 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 the product 
to approve the applications quickly and build that unique capability by solving that customer problem in a way in which no one else can could do it. Uh, and this is necessarily something that you you build because if you could buy it, everyone everyone would have it. Uh, and therefore, this thing is not for sale. It has to be built. Certainly, quite a bit of the other parts of the solution, of the IT systems that run the company, those can be bought, but not that piece that differentiates you in the digital transformation project and the digital customer experience world. That has to be built. And if this has to be built now, every company has to become more of a technology company, has to embrace the, the, the inner software company that they need to become. And this means broadening out the, uh, the work on creating software and taking a mindset of a software product company. So at City, we were always funding projects and taking years and 18 months from the beginning to the end and delivering something into production. Now, if you're a software products company, Google maybe has the best reputation for this. You push out a beta, you iterate on it, you improve it, you get feedback and you constantly work on it as a product as instead of a project. So now to build these things that you have to build to stay competitive, that everyone has to build to stay competitive in the digital world, we have to start thinking as a software company and building products and thinking, getting that mindset into our, our company. Um, certainly this was a big focus we had at, at City and I think, I think many, many have this, this kind of transition in place as well from the kind of old processes to more agile processes and to think more like a software company than a uh, financial services company. And with that, now we have to do this development. We have to become more like a software company. We have to get everyone involved in the development process. We have to extend out the capability of doing this work to more people. And, on, and, we, and we are in that process of, of trying to extend this work out to more people facing a shortage of people who are skilled at doing this, and especially in moving to the cloud, it's an acute skills shortage, skills <laughs> shortage of people who know how to engineer to get the best out of those cloud deployments, to get that always on, to get that auto scale, to get that resiliency, to get that fast uh, latency experience that everyone's come to expect from working, uh, having worked with the leaders and being familiar with the apps that do this the best on the cloud. Uh, and those skills are in very high demand because of course everyone needs to do this. So we have to expand out. We have to get what's called in the industry ad hoc developers, citizen developers to participate as well as the enterprise developers. Uh, we need to embrace, and this is a big trend in the industry of course as well, this is no news to anybody. We have to embrace some of these no code and low code abstractions to help become more productive with the development part of the challenge and to be more inclusive of people with skills that are more perhaps appropriate for the use of no code and low code abstractions, as well as having the staff to do the full code when it's needed. And all of this has to be coherent and in, in part of a, an overall program. Uh, what we don't want to see is continuing this business IT divide that traditionally has been hampering uh, us from having a great understanding of how to build applications for the, for the business for the, to meet our, our, our goals of developing and delivering new products uh, to the market. And therefore, we shouldn't be thinking of low code and no code in one group and full code in another group. Everyone needs to participate. Everyone needs to work together, whether it's using no code, low code, or full code. Okay, so now we've talked about the development piece. Let's start talking about the deployment piece because that's, if not, equally important, it might be more important. So I want to do a little compare and contrast on this to just set the context. On the left-hand side of the screen, we have classic old mainframe, a UNIVAC, one of the first mainframes ever built commercially. It ran one of the first commercial applications. I believe US Census was among them. And to use that application, you went to the computer room and you stood there as these people are doing or sitting there and interact with the computer there. And in fact, in those times, all you had was a batch interaction method. You put in a bunch of cards, put in a bunch of instructions, waited for the computer to process, and then spit out the results. It wasn't until later that interactive computing was invented, even though today we take that so much for, for granted. But in those days, one of the main points is that applications were engineered specifically for these systems 
and they had to be taking into account what the capabilities of those systems were, the resource, the disk, the CPU, the tape drive banks that you see here, all of this had to be taken into account when designing applications to be deployed on those machines. On the right-hand side, we have a typical cloud infrastructure data center. Now, you can't even go into these places if you wanted to. You interact with these over the network. And one of the biggest fundamental changes from the old computing model when we were designing applications to run on a single machine in a single place in a computer room that you went to, now we have com uh, computers running in data centers you can't get into because of the security around them. They will stop you from even getting to the building, never mind getting into the building and seeing these things. So you have no idea in cloud deployment infrastructure where your program is running, and nor should you really want to care as long as it's got the characteristics that you want, which is what this infrastructure is designed to provide. Uh, there's, so, there's so much redundancy, there's so much agility, there's so much automation necessary because now people are not interacting with these machines. It's all automated. And these things are, are designed now to get that kind of capability that's needed for the customer experience to provide the customer experience that, that is expected and the applications to get that experience similar very much the same as what was done for the mainframe world applications have to be designed and engineered to get the best out of this new kind of infrastructure which is running pc grade hardware you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of thousands of consumer grade pc servers deployed in these huge massive data centers such a different shift in terms of how infrastructure is done and it does mean a shift and it indicates there's such a shift in how computing is done from the old way to the new and i'm you know, oversimplifying a little bit but the point is the applications digital transformation products have to be engineered in such a way as to get the most out of this environment to get those qualities of service that everyone expects the agility the resiliency uh the, the scale and the speed and the lower cost because now we remember running on consumer grade pcs with a lot of open source uh, mainframes are very expensive. City has its share and they cost a lot of money. These systems there are widely adopted because they were the most the lowest cost infrastructure ever developed. That's the origin story for these things. When Google actually invented them about 20 years ago, they became a competitive advantage because they could run their website at scale and charge less for their ads because their computing infrastructure was such low cost. But to get the benefits, again, we have to engineer for it, just as we had engineered in the past for, for mainframes. Okay, so now we're talking about how do we get there? So we're in the old environment. We have some old applications. And I think I read somewhere that maybe 65% of all workloads are still in the old way, uh, done in the old way. And that makes sense because that model's been around. I think that photo is from 1960. So we're talking about 60, 70, 80 years sometimes. Uh, I know the city was running some applications that were created 40, 50 years ago. And I think that's not unusual for large companies who invested early in IT. Uh, those things work, they get in production, they tend to stay in production. The business value of replacing them is not great. However, now we're in a situation where the business value of the new infrastructure is significant enough that it cannot be ignored. And in fact, if we want to stay competitive, we have to take advantage of it because of the lower cost and all those qualities of service that everyone has come to expect because of the companies who are already leveraging this. So we can think about moving on-prem to a hybrid model. Uh, there's an investment, there's some work that needs to be done. And you know, I'll talk a little bit about a, a, a public example of this a little bit later to give more context to it. But you start and you might go step by step and you might have the target of getting to the new environment, which is uh, you realize is different. The application has a different runtime. Uh, it has different monitoring. It might have a service mesh, has SREs or a slight reliable engineering team supporting it, DevOps team supporting it, interface definition languages needs to be done for the interfaces and the APIs, pipelines to build them, network communication, first class resource, different, different kind of world, running small units of work, running microservices to run those small machines efficiently and connect up through networking to build larger systems instead of having large systems uh, as what you designed for. And some applications you may not, you know, may not be appropriate to invest for. Uh, you may want to keep them 
You may want to wrap them. You may want to run some new applications in the cloud or invest in new digital digital products there and run some things on on prem and, and make everything hybrid. And this is something else that we we feel strongly about about supporting as we go forward to the cloud. Uh, just to go a little bit more on this uh, automation, the agility is all about automation. When you move to this environment, as I said, you cannot even get into that room. System administration is all automated. Deployment is automated. Everything is automated. You're not going in and running programs. You're not touching those machines. You're not seeing even where your programs run. So the analogy is uh, shipping containers, right? And containers, Docker containers are of course named for these kinds of containers and the containers support the automation for shipping where you say just you know give us the containers here's a stack of them we'll automatically figure out how to load them from the ship to the dock from the dock to the train or the truck and it's all can be automated because now we have this standard unit that we can build the automation around and that's the same thing that's going on in the cloud native infrastructure just an interesting side note uh, you can actually get a data center in a container and sun's not around anymore, but they used to, I found this old stock photo where you could buy a data center in a container. You can still buy one from IBM. So if you need to have a container running in a container, you can do it. Just kind of a funny note. All right. So back to what we're talking about in terms of automation. So now we've got uh, Kubernetes. So we started out with uh, microservices, uh, pioneered primarily by Netflix and Amazon uh, back in you know 2009, 2010. Uh, then we had standardization of containers for microservices based on Docker. And now finally, the last sort of remaining big question for this model of how do you break up your application, automate it, and deploy it correctly was doing the orchestration for those containers. And that's where the Kubernetes standard comes in. And there were multiple candidates for this standard, but Kubernetes has one out as the standard for how you deploy these containers in these data centers. And Kubernetes has the control plane. Basically in this model, developers automate the production of Docker containers and, and give a, a configuration file to uh, Kubernetes control plane, which figures out where to place the containers in which pods, which is a Kubernetes artifact and you can see here containers are being put in different pods by Kubernetes all automated, how you deploy things and Kubernetes takes care of you know, scheduling and load balancing and availability and auto extend if resources run short. But Kubernetes main job is to figure out in those data centers, we have hundreds of thousands of consumer grade PCs running workloads where these containers go to actually run and execute your applications. No problem, right? Very easy. What could go wrong? Well, actually, Kubernetes is uh, something that if it works, you know, it's it's great. If it's up and running, it's fine. But if there's a problem, here's what you have to deal with. This is from the official Kubernetes website that talks about the troubleshooting that shows the troubleshooting guide, the workflow you have to go through to debug your problems and you can Kubernetes clusters if those occur. So, yikes, you know, let's why do we have to deal with this if all we want to do is develop and deploy applications uh, with automation and agility? Well, we don't, right? So now the industry is moving up the stack. Kubernetes has become the standard and we can tell that it's the standard because everyone is adopting it. Everyone is providing it. Every cloud, public cloud provider has it. AWS, Google, Azure, uh, Oracle, IBM, uh, you name it, DigitalOcean, uh, and you have various versions of it that can be run on-prem from your private clouds as well, such as OpenShift and Rancher and uh, Nomad. And I'm sure there are, there are others, but now this has become the deployment orchestration of containers standard for the industry. And we can start building platforms on top of it to abstract those capabilities, abstract those complexities and provide those capabilities, those containerized applications need such as a multi-cloud, multi-cluster handling, secrets and config management, identity access management, doing the CICD uh, for whatever Kubernetes flavor you have, handling storage, monitoring, logging, API access, CLI access. Uh, remember in the cloud, there's no operations team to call. Everything's provisioned by APIs. So the APIs are in scope here for what's needed to how you interact with this. 
and those can be abstracted to work with any flavor of Kubernetes. Now that we have that as a standard, we can start moving up the stack and providing additional value, one-click uh, deployments and so on. Okay, so now back to, to WSO2 and what we're doing. Given all of this, we need to do development for digital application products to be competitive, can't be bought. We need to figure out how to deploy those things on modern cloud infrastructure to get the best value out of them, get the best customer experience. And Kubernetes has become a standard on which we can build platforms. So how about a platform for APIs and services that's built on top of Kubernetes and helps solve these problems and helps you be more productive by delivering that platform to you instead of you having to build it and put all the pieces together yourself. So that's, that's what we're doing. So this is Corio. It's in beta, GA in January. This is the vision of it. We're working toward this. Uh, we can talk about how far we are on the journey, but basically we're pretty far. And we have the, the GA in, in uh, January, as I mentioned, but what's in the box is, uh, you know, I'll start on the upper left here. This is, you, you have, in, we, we assume you have an input here through a business architecture, solution architecture, what's the granularity of your microservices? What are your APIs? How do you do API first? And we have consulting practice can help you figure that out. It's not part of the platform. On the other side, on the left-hand side here, we start to look at what's in the platform. Sorry, the right-hand side. I, I'm one of those people that mix up my left and right. Sorry, uh, my sister and I talk about this sometimes. So, anyway, so on the right-hand side, the, we have the development abstractions for no code for system developers, low code for ad hoc developers, and full code for enterprise developers, all producing the same code under the covers that get puts into GitHub and triggers the build, test, and deploy run and manage pipeline automatically, uh, publishes the API, consumes APIs from the API marketplace that represent existing services on-prem or from SaaS that can be integrated to other services and integrated to other APIs. So we're talking about how do you easily create APIs, microservices, and how do you easily deploy them into Kubernetes to run on the cloud? And that's what this platform is all about. <clears throat> Other aspects of the platform are shown here as well at the bottom for business analytics, observability to see how the code is running, AI to help you build the right code in the first place, and security for zero trust uh, deployments, which is of course very important in the cloud as well. So we have the dev piece abstracted, no code, low code, full code all working together seamlessly. And we have the ops piece abstracted as well. So once the code is built, everything is deployed at one touch. So this gives a little context to what it is we're working on, what it is we're providing, which is low-code integration, developing microservices, including service mesh if it needs to be transparently, inputs, solution architecture, domain driven design artifacts. And again, we can help with those if needed uh, and put into GitHub, run through DevOps pipeline using the GitOps configuration mechanism to create the Kubernetes config file and deploy out to Kubernetes all uh, automatically. API management built in, API marketplace built in, integration with other systems built in, observability, security, AI machine learning uh, built in, all running on the cloud. All right, so now I just you want to talk a little bit about this example I mentioned. This is, I want to be clear, first of all, Capital One is not a customer of WSO2s, but they recently completed a move to the cloud. They put all of their applications into AWS and they basically closed all of their on-prem IT centers. And you know, working at City, we would have looked at these guys and said, wow, that, you know, how could we do this? We were really sort of struggling to get some applications in the cloud, get them in securely, which I'll also talk about in, in a minute. Uh, we were a little scared by the Capital One breach a couple of years ago and we sort of pulled back from some of our, our deployments because we we're starting to see the potential for similar incidents. But nonetheless, these guys powered through, they did it. It's all in AWS now, it's all running there. And we looked at the case studies and they talk about these things that are industry trends or representative of the industry trends. Uh, so I thought it would be a good example to talk about a little bit. So this is from their case study, this is their words. They said they have achieved a competitive event at edge by the ability to serve customers at the speed they demand, meaning they can provide the agility 
the speed to market for new features multiple times a day. And this is what the, the, the best practices people do. Amazon uh, website, for example, I've talked to some of their developers. They came to City to talk with us about how they do their website. Everything is a, is a microservice. They click one click pay button is a microservice. The review feature is a microservice given to a different team and they deploy whenever they are ready. They don't have to wait for each other to be ready to deploy. They deploy independently and they push hundreds, if not thousands of changes out a day because of that, that practice. And so Capital One is now adopting this as well. Amazon helped them do this. Uh, they had, they had uh, Adrian Cockcroft, for example, working with them uh, and helping them to get that same kind of agility through creating their microservices in such a way that they had the bounded context and the, and the two pizza autonomous teams working independently and deploying out by as long as the interfaces were, were governed strictly and maintained. And they have got the benefits of doing this uh, as the digital leadership has, uh, digital leading companies have. And now they talk about themselves as a technology company that offers financial services as digital products, not as a bank. And a lot of banks and cities sometimes would say this too, where we are a technology company. And sometimes that's true and sometimes it's not, but I think Capital One has made that leap as well as anybody has and may be able to claim that they are a technology company as much as anybody and provides you know, an example to, for us to, to try to, to uh, emulate. And they were able to deliver innovation more quickly. However, you know, this is last, but it's not least, the kicker is they had to invest. They had to invest in a governance function, they had to invest in security practices, and again, last but not least, training for cloud literacy to get their developers to be uh, trained up. Uh, and I, you know, I've talked with uh, Adrian about this, and he said one of the key changes they made was to onshore their developers. And a lot of banks, uh, City has huge offshore development team, a lot of banks do. But to create this kind of a transformation to become a technology company that offers digital products and to create agility and speed to market that gives them the competitive event edge, they had to invest in highly skilled uh, developers and, and software engineers uh, on site to do this. And that was part of the change that they, they made, part of the big investment. And this took them, took them four years. We think this is a great thing to do, but it shouldn't take four years. The market has matured to the point at which we have standards in place to build on. We have low code abstractions to introduce, to make development more productive, to make deployment abstract, and to cut the amount of time it takes to achieve something like this dramatically. So just a minute about this evolution of platforms. And I think it's pretty clear Kubernetes is going to be there for a while and we can make this assumption safely. We always get this whenever you make a claim like that. Okay, until something else comes along, Kubernetes is going to be there. Well, yes, it's true. But I remember this being said about web services 20 years ago when it came out, but we still have that around. It's still there. I think, of course, something else is going to come along. But for the moment and for a long moment, for the foreseeable future, the industry has standardized on Kubernetes uh, for the container orchestration for microservices, uh, the way it's standardized on Docker for containers, and that's the last major piece of the puzzle for how you join your development to your deployment for the modern infrastructure. Sorry, other candidates, Roku, Cloud Foundry, OpenStack, Mesos, Swarm. You guys lost Kubernetes one, and it's gonna be there for a while. Sure, there are problems, but now, we assume Kubernetes, we're starting abstracting the flavor of it into platforms that we build, such as when we're building. And now that we know Kubernetes will be there for our containers to deploy, to create, to help create this agility, reliability, and scale, we can develop and auto deploy APIs and services uh, with confidence that this is going to, to be working and helpful and be there for foreseeable future. All right, so I just wanna spend a couple of minutes on security. This was of course, uh, another big topic uh, at, at City, and something I, I was I was involved in the last year and a half that I was there. Here at WSO2, we see the need to include in our cloud offering, the, our security offering as well. So we have two main product lines, the API management, which we're extending now to include development of APIs and services and deployment to the cloud. 
And for the identity access management, we're extending that to the cloud, providing a software as a service version of that as well to help in putting them together to make sure that the APIs are protected, that there is identity for the APIs, that there we can be a federate the APIs with other identity access mechanisms for single sign-on, bridging identity, and start to construct strong uh, authentication systems and fine grain access control, which is very important for the cloud. I'll get a little bit more on, on, on that, but just to say, this is another area we see that needs attention in this picture to put the pieces together. We need to have security. So challenges on the APIs and services, uh, you know, not least of which is the pressure to go to market. And when I was running the security architecture team in the consumer bank, we had encountered quite a variety of, of development projects, some of whom would talk to us very early on, such as the Google project. They got us involved right in the beginning. We helped design and make sure we had all the right security standards in place so that when it was time to go to production, reviewing was more of a check the box to confirm they'd done what they said they did. We had other teams that came to us two weeks before production and said, oh, uh, we need a you know a security review. Can you guys sign off on this, please? Uh, we would look at it and we would see that they hadn't done the authentication correctly to standard. They hadn't done encryption where they should have. <clears throat> you know, They hadn't done key management where they should have uh, secrets for the data store or something like this. And we'd have to say, sorry, guys, you have not conform to security. And of course, that would not go over too well. So we were trying to figure out uh, the best way to sort of standardize the inclusion of security at the beginning of the project's life cycle. And it isn't something you can add in at the last minute. When this happens, when you get to almost you know, a few weeks from production, and you're told you're not meeting security standards, it can be a lot of work. You have to go back and rework a lot of things. It's better to do that from the beginning, it's easier. It's like, I think it's like user interface or you can't really uh, go back and retrofit a good user experience. You have to think about that before you start. And security is the same thing. And it can be sometimes more challenging with automation because once you put the automation in place, that's a great time saver and you've got the agility and the time to market and you're building your containers and throwing them out into Kubernetes and you need to change them. You build a new container, throw it out again and do this rapidly can be very helpful for rapidity. But as we talked about with Kubernetes clusters, if there's a problem with the automation, it can be hard to fix and you need specialized skills uh, to do that. So that's something else that has to be done early and at the beginning is figure out the security scanning, the security testing, container scanning, uh, vulnerability testing, all these things that can be automated, but if they're not, uh, or if there's a problem with the automation, that can be a challenge as well the project's going to production. So this basically to do this, as I said, we one of the things we were trying to do and one of the um, you know, important concepts out there is security as code, meaning you can get your security standards and policies and practices embedded in code, keep the developer to focus in their IDEs. A lot of them are not security experts anyway, give them the code, put it in the code at the beginning uh, of their development project and confirm it during their pipeline and automation builds is a much easier way to make sure things get done the right way and you can pass those reviews and get into production uh, very easily. Um, skills, again, high demand for security so we can offer uh, low code abstractions as we talked about earlier to improve the productivity but also embed the identity access management, the identities for the APIs in the code embed the, the federation in the code for the workflows for the API integration and so on, and keep pace with innovation by linking to cloud services. This is something, uh, I, you know, a couple of years ago at HPTS conference 2019, I presented a paper called Banking on the Cloud that talked about some of our challenges at, at City. This link is available. You can check the, the rest of the presentation, but we had, identified some specific challenges uh, for security in the cloud having to do with the different nature of the cloud, the different nature of the infrastructure. Remember, cloud computing basically started for you know, what we know it as today with Amazon offering storage and compute as web services. So this was all designed for access over the web. It was not really within a data center designed when you access, you weren't going in the room or emulating going in the room to use a computer, you were always using things over the internet and that creates 
a certain additional level of vulnerability uh, that you need to take into account. Uh, and there's different different security principles that were network constraints. And I think the biggest thing is really the third bullet here. We found the misconfigured policies and permissions uh, because there's no operations team, everything is done with APIs. It's easy to get an overprivileged account changing a configuration on a storage bucket. This is basically what happened to the Capital One breach and allow somebody to access data from some other company or some other application since it's all a shared environment. Um, and it's very hard to present these misconfigurations. And it's one reason security has uh, city pulled back from deploying on the cloud because we're having some of these issues uh, where these overprivileged accounts were changing privileges on the shared services and allowing potentially uh, an incident. We didn't have any, but you know, because we were we detected these things, but this is uh, makes it more difficult. So this is just saying we really need to make sure you have the right identity system in place for the APIs that you create for applications and tie that to the authorization systems that can control the access to shared services so that you have the, what's called the least privileged access uh, in place so that you don't have a, a in worst case, you might have a blast radius so of somebody with an overprivileged account getting into data from multiple companies in a shared cloud environment. Uh, guardrails really help with that. And uh, I guess with that, uh, we will uh, we will wrap up and say um, time, time for questions. Yeah, we do, Eric. We do have a few minutes to take some questions from our guests if, uh, if they have any. Um, so, there is a uh, Q&A um, at the bottom of your, your Zoom window there that you can uh, pop a question in there if you want and uh, Eric can uh, have a go at, uh, at answering it. In the meantime, whilst our guests are figuring out how to do that, uh, I've got one for you, Eric. Well, thank you very much for, for that, uh, that talk. Uh, very interesting. Um, I mean, it's interesting, there's, there's so much new technologies that the banking, particularly financial services industry have adopted, but there is still some, you know, um, uh, delay with some of them in adopting some, uh, some of these new technologies uh, around the concern of security, particularly in the cloud. So I was, I was wondering what your thoughts are with, with the adoption of the new cloud native, you know, technologies is there a bigger threat around security than they used to be? Or do you see that actually as a, a more secure environment if they go down these new modern, modern technology uh, adoption paths? Well, that's a great uh, question, Tess. Generally speaking, the cloud has all the security controls you need. The cloud providers have made this a huge focus. Amazon in particular has created a huge suite of security tools and services and monitoring uh, capabilities uh, for encryption, for controlling access to things. And if you use the tools correctly, the cloud actually can be more secure than uh, the on-prem environment. The reason I say that is because the on-prem environment uh, typically was not designed in a way in which we were worried about this level of, of secure access. Uh, at City, we would have a program, for example, to encrypt all communications and encrypt all data at rest. None of this was really done when those systems were put in place because we were expecting the perimeter would block the uh, attackers from getting in and therefore we didn't need to encrypt our, our messages in our systems. On the cloud, we assume this is going to be a problem from the beginning. So everything is encrypted from the start, the data is all encrypted, everything on the wire is encrypted, strong authentication mechanisms are put in place, a lot of attention is put on security monitoring and alerting and rapid response. So I think it actually can be more secure uh, if it's if, if the tools are used uh, the right way. Yeah, interesting, isn't it? Uh, I think certainly more and more financial institutions are feeling a little bit more comfortable about that. So I think you're right, um, but there's still a long way to go. The, some of the traditional banks are still concerned about uh, about their data and their customers' data, and, and fair enough in in some parts of the world. Um, so that was oh, that was sure. great. Um, I liked one of your slides earlier, uh, Eric, around around the no code, low code, and, and making it easier for an organisation, whether it's a, a bank or any other organisation, to really adopt 
uh, innovation through top to bottom. So making it a, you know, a cultural uh, exercise rather than just, you know, a developer hardcore tech team's job to innovate and, and, and leverage digital. What are you seeing now in the market around this adoption of low code, no code to provide, you know, broader users across, across an organization, the ability to be able to be innovative and create ideas and help, help the company take something new to market faster and easier. So what, what are your thoughts around this adoption of, of, you know, these cloud native iPads technologies using no code and low code? Well, I think we're just starting to see this, uh, the low code phenomenon coming into the integration space. Really, it started in the end user space, the GUI space. You know, if you look at the pioneers such as Mendix, uh, their original market space was all around creating a graphical user interface for a website out of a, a collection of building blocks that you could easily put together. Uh, they didn't really have a, a, a great solution for integration for creating APIs, for creating services, for creating any new code that would need to be added into those graphical user environments. They have some support for that, but that was never really the focus. If you look at, at digital transformation projects, uh, I think it was uh, MuleSoft who did a survey on this. Many of them uh, are challenged be uh, because of the integration behind the API. So you can put an API in place, you can put a front end in place, but if you don't have that connectivity the integration to the backend system that's not only the source of the data, but the repository of the data. If you don't have that piece working, uh, you're not going to have the whole, the whole story. So I think where uh, no code and low code tools have had their success has been in this kind of abstracting building blocks and putting applications together quickly, but tending to be on the simple side of things and not really tackling the, the hard problems so much. And what we're seeing is a good space and a good area of the market where we can contribute uh, a, you know, a bit more sophisticated kind of uh, a low code by, by creating drawings that generate code and then have the ability to work in that code if you need to extend it. Going back to the Mendix example, if you needed to do something that wasn't in the tool, you would have to create your own building block, which required you to understand Mendix and do something specific to that tool to get another capability beyond what they have implemented. Whereas with our tool, it's all transparent between what's at the code level and what's at the diagram level and what's at the template level for no code. It's all, it's, it's all, it's all there in one box. You don't have a, you know, a brick wall, you know, as you run into when you exhaust the capabilities of a certain uh, tool that might be a, offering a low code abstraction. Unreal. All right. Well, look, thank you, Eric. I really appreciate uh, those insights that you gave us around helping other organizations or other financial institutions, you know, and, and tips from, from, from your good self around accelerating cloud-enabled financial services. Uh, that was some pretty, pretty interesting points you raised today, and I really appreciate the time you've taken tonight from New York to, to join our customers and friends uh, from down under. Um, I, don't, I don't see any other questions, so it looks like uh, you've been that thorough in your uh, presentation that uh, everyone's completely clear on, uh, on, on the way forward. And uh, again, I thank everyone for joining us today. Um, there's going to be some more webinars coming up in the, in the coming weeks and months, so stay tuned for, uh, for more webinars from WSO2.